So good morning, everybody. This is the last uh, lecture in the frames of the conference Transnational Women's Literature in Europe. And it's my honor and pleasure to introduce you, Professor Jean-Baptiste Joly, who is here with us today to give this lecture. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Jolie is the director and the founder of the Academie Schloss Solitude in Stuttgart, which is one of the biggest residential arts centers in Europe. And uh, they, host, um, they have hosted approximately 400 writers, artists, and scholars in the past uh, 23 years of the existence of the Academy. Jean-Baptiste Jolie studied German literature and linguistics in Paris and Berlin. He is also the former director of the French Cultural Institute in Stuttgart, but since 1989 he is the chairman of the board of the Foundation Academie Schloss Solitude and he is the director, both artistic and founding director of the Academy. He is also an honorary professor of the Kunsthochschule Weissensee, College of Art and Design, Berlin. Um, and he is a member of board of trustees in different foundations and cultural institutions in Germany and France. What I would emphasize from the perspective of this conference, that as director of the Academy Solitude, he is also the initiator of an East European network and cooperation involving uh, many small uh, regional art NGOs from Central and Eastern Europe, and by involving them, He's enab en enabling the entrance of these small NGOs into the transnational network of art institutions all over the world. Um, he has worked with these 400 artists, writers, and scholars in the Academy Solitude, uh, a little bit as a curator, as an editor, uh, and I have to tell you that he knows everything about these 400 people with whom he has worked. He's also editor of scholarly books like Workspaces in Art, Science and Business or the uh, Remembering and Forgetting to the Possibilities of uh, the Representation of Trauma. And I would like to welcome him once more very, very warmly and thanking him for coming here and giving this exciting lecture about books that don't sell but are necessary. Thank you, Jean-Baptiste. Thank you for the kind words, dear Rufia, and uh, thank you for the invitation. But books that don't sell but are necessary. So the uh, lecture will be divided in, uh, with an introduction with general information about Academic Schloss Solitude. In the first part I will speak about the place of literature in the Solitude program next to the other artistic disciplines and scientific disciplines. Then I will focus in a second part on the program, literary program called Edition Solitude that we founded in 1992. And in the third part I will speak about literature as a personal experience and that will be probably the moment where uh, my understanding of what uh, transnational literature could be will somehow shift a little bit from what you have been speaking about uh, in the last two or three days. And, uh, in the conclusion, I will uh, explain uh, books that don't sell, yes or no, for whom are they necessary. So you see here the Castle Solitude in Stuttgart, the left wing with the red tiles, this is completely dedicated to the activities of the Academy Schloss Solitude, and half of the second uh, building on the right side is also dedicated to the activities of the academy. The castle in the middle uh, is a folly of the 18th century and uh, is a pure museum that is somehow untouchable uh, and from time to time for contemporary art, but not that often. The Academy Schloss Solitude is a classic residential program that was conceived in the late 80s by the state of Baden-Württemberg as a kind of black box for uh, experience uh, in contemporary art, hidden in a baroque castle. And uh, this is probably the most interesting thing concerning Academy Schloss Solitude. It was founded by the state of Baden-Württemberg, which is not a nation, and it has an international task. It means we do not know at all the national level of cultural decisions. This is something that is 
specific in Germany, but in Germany, the different states of the Federal Republic are normally not involved in international matters. We do. So, 45 studios, and we are hosting every year between 60 and uh, 120 fellows for shorter or longer terms. And uh, we didn't host in the last 23 years 400 fellows, but 1,100 in the different disciplines that are uh, visual and performing arts, music and sound, new medias, architecture, literature and design. And in addition to this, uh, since 11 years, we have a program dedicated to a dialogue between art, science and economy. And for this program, we are involving humanist scientists. At the moment, we have lawyers, specialists of labor law, uh, as uh, one of the three disciplines. Two are mandatory. This is uh, uh, what we call in German Geisteswissenschaften, humanities. Another one that is economy. And the third is always at disposal of the jury chair. Uh, so in the, the program of Academic Law Solitude, we distribute to all the fellows a monthly fellowship of uh, 1,100 euros. We pay the travel costs. We offer the studios for free and we help the artists and the fellows by supporting their programs, their projects and all the activities you will see are exclusively dedicated to the fellows hosted in the house. So uh, every two years we have a call for applications and we receive around 700 applications, uh, last time from 105 countries in the world. And 4,000 people downloaded the applications, and half of them applied. And 4,000 people were downloading the applications from 140 countries in the world. And if you know that for the United Nations program, there are 197 different nations. So with a team of 12 people, we are close to a, a globalized program. There are some weaker points on the on the world map, and this is especially uh, the African continent, we, had, we have more or less every time only 2 to 3 percent of applicants from Africa. And uh, in the whole program we hosted also 2 to 3 percent of uh, African artists or writers. At the moment we are working on a new program that will start in a couple of weeks. Uh, that is especially dedicated with this uh, additional budget to artists from the African continent. What you see here, those uh, nice people sitting in uh, one of our uh, rooms, a multi-purpose room, uh, is the jury of some years ago, I think it was in 2009, and uh, when I speak about 700 applications and uh, 65 <coughs> or 70 people uh, being accepted, uh, the decisions are taken in each decision in general by one single person deciding alone about the selection. So we want to have a very subjective level of decisions. And if you look at the picture here, this guy is the famous New York artist Dan Graham. Uh, this is uh, uh, Sarah Morris, a British artist based, uh, based in uh, New York. Behind her, this is, you will see him again, uh, Mircea Cartarescu, who was our juror for uh, literature uh, four years ago. And here you have Lucia Ronchetti, the, the Italian composer, who was in charge of music. And, for, and so on. This is Beatrice Colomina from Princeton, in charge uh, of architecture this year. And this is Hans Ulrich Gumbrecht from Stanford, uh, who was in charge of uh, humanities four years ago. And this is Vladimir Bolchakov from uh, Harvard Medical School and the biologist, uh, specialist of brain, who was in charge of biology. And she's from the University of Vienna in, in charge of uh, economy. So as you see, uh, a selection that is made by a totally international jury for people who are applying for the whole world on behalf of a state, Baden-Württemberg, with the population of 11 million inhabitants, which is a little bit bigger than uh, some countries uh, in uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, so with all those artists who are staying in the house for between 6 and 12 months, we organize a program of activities. Uh, and this is the genuine profile of Academic Law Solitude. We are not inviting many people just like this, but we dedicate the program and the funding to projects realized 
by the fellows, that's how we call them. So what you see here is an installation realized by an artist, uh, Naufus uh, Figueroa Ramirez, uh, born in Guatemala, uh, growing up in a village uh, uh, of uh, guerrilleras, a women village of guerrilleras in Guatemala, and uh, growing up afterwards in exile in Canada, who, who was uh, in solitude two years ago, and this is a, a nice installation he realized. This is a design project that was ending as a performance about exchange of objects and the value of exchange. It was in November last year. You see fellows of the academy who are all playing a performance, playing a kind of a very tough administration that is obliging people bringing objects to go through a very complex and arbitrary system of classification and authorization in order to give an object, deliver an object, and get another one for this. So this is a kind of a performance game in, in order to understand what is the value and how does it work in society with which rules. So, and this is uh, another design project also was taking place last year. We are in the castle here and uh, the four fellows you see uh, on the left, it's a German architect. The second left is an Israeli designer. The third is a Greek composer and the fourth is an Iranian uh, filmmaker. They all wear black dresses that were made for them as a project by a design fellow, a fashion designer, who was making interviews with them in order to see what would be their ideal clothes they, would, they could wear in any circumstance. And this was all made with the same fabric, but every uh, dress was shaped differently. This was a project that we hosted uh, last year. And in the same room, some special clothes she developed for uh, an exhibition and for a theater play. And uh, new music, uh, we host preferably uh, composers because they are less supported than interpreters and they have less possibilities of getting money for their work. So we are focusing rather on uh, composers than uh, on uh, interpreters. And this is here a conference in the frame of our art science business program. It was in 2000, at the end of 2009, and this is Mircea Carterescu uh, giving a talk in our conference dedicated to dealing with fear. Is fear the only thing that is holding society together? Was a topic we were dealing with in the last, uh, in the years from 2009 to 2012. Uh, involving as well economy, social sciences, uh, philosophy, sociology, anthropology, and all the artistic disciplines. And uh, just to complete uh, the landscape, this is a, a theater performance that was uh, presented in a barn that is also part uh, of the compound of solitude. And uh, it's a very special uh, play for which there are no actors, but uh, only a text and a timetable, and people are listening and reading, and they are uh, reinventing theater by thinking, is it theater what I'm experiencing and not? This got uh, the first prize of the uh, theater festival uh, in Stuttgart a few weeks ago, and this is a production of uh, last year. So within this large program, which is somehow something like uh, 100 different events every year, which place could we uh, give uh, to literature, knowing that uh, compared to other artistic activities, literature is a low noise practice, a not spectacular practice, not expensive, but has long-term effects, and how to make literature visible, hearable, and public in a place that is dedicated to supporting young artists. So, uh, we, as you know, in Germany, readings are part of the cultural life, and uh, readings with uh, unknown writers, like uh, here on the uh, left side, anne Katrin Heyer, who was in solitude last year, and who is not famous, she is just publishing now her first novel. Uh, to make a, no a lecture like this interesting, we try to frame it and to organize it a little bit differently. Next to her, is a, a German graphic designer uh, who is uh, improvising uh, possible front pages of the text for the text she is reading at the same time and showing them 
during the reading so that uh, the visualization of the work is accessible for the audience uh, permanently. Sometimes we, inv we invite guests and uh, it's my pleasure to show you this picture because I love her too. And this is Hélène Sixous, you recognized her, she was in solitude uh, in March 2008 and uh, she had a public uh, reading at Literaturhaus in Stuttgart the evening before and we spent one day with her in a workshop dedicated to her book, you know it, Cypre, the, this book about her childhood and her mother in, in Algeria and uh, she's so beautiful. Okay. <laughs> so and this is uh, also another activity which, is, which means combining literature uh, for example with music, this is a uh, German writer, Susanne Heinrich, uh, who is a specialist of rap poetry, and she was bringing in the house uh, another scene that is normally not so often visiting the house, and she brought her friends uh, from Berlin. They are dealing together. So, uh, a transnational literary program in an international and transnational dialogue of Academic Law Solitude means that literature is visible in catalogues of artists, that we organize public readings, that uh, also it happens quite often that composers are preparing musical settings of poetry and which uh, are then uh, presented uh, for the audience and that performances are combining literature with music, dance and uh, visual art. Another important presence of uh, literature in the house is due to the four or five libraries uh, we have in the house and uh, they are dedicated uh, um, to books that are used by the fellows and the origin of each library is always an artistic project where we ask somebody to shape a room as a library and to decide about the first, how to say, the first nucleus of books, the first hundred books, so that it gives somehow a direction and uh, a profile to uh, and an identity to the library. So this is the very first library that was, uh, uh, s s how to say, staged by uh, artists of Stuttgart and each fellow in the house has the right to suggest two or three titles. So when you take a book from the library and you open it, you see it was suggested by this fellow and this year, so let's imagine that in 20 years from now, we would make a catalogue of the books of the library, it would tell the story of the house. And I was thinking about doing this after five years, after 10 years, now after 20 years, and finally I said, no, the day where we make this list of books telling the story of the house, it means that it's the last book, it's finished. So we will never do it, we just continue. So this is one library. Uh, the second one, which is Hermann's library, you see it here, uh, is dedicated to uh, a prisoner who uh, is a Black Panther member and who is in solitary confinement uh, in a prison in Louisiana since uh, 1969 uh, because uh, of a complex story. He was uh, robbing a, a bank on behalf of the Black Panthers uh, in 67 but organized, he was uh, uh, sued and f uh, had to stay for five years in Louisiana and in a prison there and uh, he organized a resistance in the prison and for this he was condemned for a murder that happened in a prison but that he didn't commit and in order to have him out uh, of uh, the zone of influence and so he's condemned to solitary confinement uh, since 69 uh, in uh, solitary confinement. First in Louisiana, now in New Orleans, and an activist uh, artist who was uh, in solitude in 2006 organized a big project around him and uh, his situation as part of uh, her artistic activities. And uh, we were asking him, uh, together with uh, this uh, American activist, Jackie Summer, what would be his ideal library of uh, 100 books. And what you see here, it's not totally readable, uh, is the list of the books uh, he would like to have if he were in a library. And uh, so the books are here behind the plexiglass uh, displays here. And those books are um, 
Mao Zedong, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, Henry Rocha, uh, and then books of laws. Uh, and he was maintaining in his mind a state, a political statement of the 60s, because he was not out for such a long time. And uh, because I'm representing a German institution in a democratic country, uh, I wrote him, I reacted and sent him a letter asking, uh, dear Hermann, uh, you know that uh, I'm here in Germany, it's a democratic country, and uh, really participating in a project officially for the library and having books of uh, uh, murderers of 20th century, it's not, it's not easy, and what do you say about this? And I mentioned the names I mentioned. And then he said, he answered, we had a nice uh, exchange, and then he answered, uh, you mentioned all those names, but you didn't mention Albert Speer, who was also on my list, because he's German. Eh? So, and uh, so we were arguing about this, and uh, at the end I tried to explain, it's not about censorship, but it's about that it's clear, that it's part of, it's part of an artistic project, and uh, that uh, the books are available, and that we think that it's very important, but I have to react, and not to do so as if it wouldn't be something totally normal to do so. And uh, finally he agreed, and uh, I'm, the last letter I sent him, it was one year ago, he didn't answer. I know that he was going through a very difficult uh, situation uh, in the prison. Uh, there were three of them who were condemned. One was liberated because it was, he could prove that it was not even in the prison at the time when it happened. The second uh, has been liberated, and now he's the last one uh, in prison, and he's 72, I think, in the meantime. So, this is literature, and this is transnational. Huh? So, and, transna and literature in the frame of solitude, it means also that every two years, we, we produce a kind of yearbook presenting all the activities of the academy and that uh, among all the contributions of the fellows uh, who are in the house, so uh, we have also literary texts involved in those books. Uh, so what we offer to writers who are in our program are opportunities of cooperation with other disciplines inside but also contacts to translators. You will see that they have a crucial role in our program, to translators, to editors, to libraries, to literaturhäuser and bookshops for public readings, and, uh, all, uh, and to German publishers for uh, many of them. So I come now to this book. Uh, that was uh, published in Stuttgart, not by Akademisch Los Solitude, in 1991 uh, by Jutta Le Verlag uh, and uh, the author is Anisa Dek. And it's a story I would like to tell because this is how the whole began with, with her. She was belonging to the first generation and uh, a little bit more experienced than other fellows and a little bit more demanding too. And uh, so she came to me with a manuscript, Rod Lavals, and telling me, so, uh, writers are not so visible in this house and uh, I would like to make a book and do you think you could make this book for us? And uh, I think that if I have a budget like a visual artist, I should have a book myself. And uh, so we were not ready for answering this question and that's uh, how, I don't remember if it's uh, Annie who found Jutta Le Goy or if I, which, whom I knew, but finally they agreed, and we agreed that Solitude would put money, which means uh, we'd, we would buy a certain number of copies of this book, so that the risk taken uh, by the publishing house wouldn't be that big. And the book was published uh, at uh, Utah Le Goy Verlag. And I show you a very important experience, which you will see again. And this is the wonderful false symmetry between two languages on a double page of a book. And this is for me one of the most beautiful things when we speak about an international literature, which is having two languages mirroring each other, but not being totally equal, because uh, it says the same, so you have the impression, it says the same, but it's a little bit shifted, some lines are longer, some lines are, are shorter. For me, every time, 
the double page of a bilingual book, especially in poetry, is something like, like a discovery of uh, the brightness uh, of the world. So that's how we came to funding our own uh, edition program, uh, which uh, we uh, call uh, Edition Solitude, or uh, Edition Solitude, or of Deutsch Edition Solitude. Uh, we are choosing two to four publications uh, per year with a kind of committed lecture. It means that we ask experts from outside what they think about the manuscripts that are submitted by the fellows. And in general, we have uh, more or less the same number of manuscripts and books that can be published. It happens rarely that we don't accept a book. Some years there were more manuscripts than books, but it happens also that for some years we had more possibilities of making books than we received manuscripts. So this idea of a committed lecture is important. It means that uh, when you receive a book, we just give it to somebody who is reading in another language, for example. So we send a book, I don't know, to South Africa uh, as a PDF, it's easy, or to Hungary, or, and we have friends everywhere in the network, and they tell us, it's just a good book, you should do it. And they say this, which is very important, from another perspective than the perspective of the institution based and located in Stuttgart. They say, yes, it's a good book from South Africa, from Brazil, or from Argentina. And it's totally different of what happens normally for a publishing house, which is also a reason why it's not sure that such books have a real chance of success in your own country. So then uh, what we do is also receiving manuscripts. We have a colleague in the team who is able to make editing which means to speak uh, with the author and to go through the text, if it's in German, or we ask people from those different countries in the large network of solitude, or we ask the writer himself if she's interested in having somebody who would work on the text with her, and we organize translation again through the network we have worldwide through the former fellows. So it means that we really have at hand all the contacts and the possibilities and the expertise for making books possible. Then we try to uh, organize readings and we participated in the Frankfurt Book Fair from 1992 to 2011 and now we decided that we quit Frankfurt and we go exclusively to Leipzig where we really meet interesting uh, bookshops and uh, where we meet also real readers. And which is for us uh, an important fact. So I show you now the kind of statistics between the different books uh, we have published uh, in the different categories. We have a collection called Reihe Projektiv. This is about projects of fellows in all the disciplines. We have a uh, collection, a series called uh, Reihe Reflexiv. This is a theory books, but since three years they are only online and you can consult them also for free. And the third collection is dedicated to real books, and this is the literary collection. So we have published uh, now 67 literary books, 13 fiction, 7 essays, 4 plays, and 26 poetry. And I'm so happy that we have so much poetry, which doesn't sell, as you know. Mm -hmm. So concerning the languages, uh, for the 67 books, um, we had uh, a third in German, Romanian with 11 books, Hungarian 10, but this year we have a new book in Hungarian by Andres Gerevich, so we will have also 11, and English 10, and we will have a book by Doug Rice, uh, who, so we will have also 11, 11, 11, between Romanian, Hungarian, and English, Russian 4, French 3, Chinese 2, and one from each language, Polish, Greek, Spanish, Portuguese, Latvian, and uh, Lithuanian. Uh, why so many books for uh, Romania and Hungary? Uh, we can speak about this. Uh, I think that uh, the literary contributions of those two countries and two languages to uh, a kind of European consciousness of culture is uh, essential and unknown 
and that we have to make a special effort on this. Uh, we have this special relationship uh, with the Josef Attila uh, circle here with the young writers. That's how we, feed it, we fed the program with the uh, Hungarian writers. And uh, I think that we have to do more for Romania. That is a country that, is, uh, uh, that was even more traumatized, if possible, uh, than other countries in Europe, especially intellectuals. And uh, uh, just to understand this affect, uh, as you understand when I speak with you, I'm French and I'm living in Germany. I'm, I'm somehow socialized between the friendship of those two countries, and uh, which uh, was for me uh, somehow a change in my life that uh, I could think uh, otherness and Europe, being a French living in Germany or being in Germany and moving back to France and so on. And I think that for those of my generation who went through this incredible process of friendship between the two countries, we have a special responsibility uh, towards the construction of Europe. And uh, that, that's the reason why uh, I always take invitations, fast, almost always, when I'm invited to, for example, to Hungary. Uh, but this was too personal. Uh, so the poetry books are all uh, bilingual original language and German. For other literary books, uh, many are in German, but we try, if we have enough uh, space in the book, to make them uh, uh, bilingual. So, for example, Die Liebe im Ausland, uh, uh, Love Abroad by Sandra Kellein was written in German. It's the first, very first generation of books we published. And the other one, Redemptive James O'Brien, is a play that was published uh, in 91. And uh, we published the book with the German translation as well as the English original text. I don't know if some of you remember the UK in the early 90s. This was a, a justice case called the Bridgewater Four. Uh, people who were sued for uh, murder they, they didn't commit. We, well, with artists were always ending in justice cases. Uh, and this is probably also a responsibility of uh, art to go into questions like this. So just to see, to present to you how they were looking at that time, <coughs> beautifully made uh, with uh, canson paper. And uh, they don't look like books, but they are beautiful and they were very expensive in the production at that time. <laughs> and this one uh, is an interesting case uh, of transnational uh, literature. Hung Gost was born in Vietnam, in North Vietnam. And he wrote this book, Der Zwischenfall, um, <clears throat> when he was in solitude, and his, it's probably the only German book written in German by a veteran of, the, of North Vietnam who uh, was invited to Germany in a special friendship program between uh, Vietnam and the German Democratic Republic in the early 80s, uh, just uh, to offer chances to uh, courageous sold, former soldiers of the North Vietnam. So he came to Germany, to the to, uh, German Democratic Republic, was working in, in a company in the, on the production line, and then he learned German, entered uh, uh, into a system of uh, education of writing, as you know, which was the origin of the program in Leipzig. Some of you will have heard about this. And he married the German. So Hungurst is writing a book in German, short stories about uh, things that happened uh, during the Vietnam War, see from the other side. And uh, the way he was writing was very interesting because his German was okay, but not perfect. So uh, he uh, was very influenced by Hemingway and by the efficiency of this narrative style of the short stories by Hemingway, who are always going to the, to the essential point and making very simple sentences. and. Somehow, this is something everybody knows who is speaking another language than his mother tongue. How you just dodge an obstacle by saying it another way. Everybody knows about this. And uh, for me, this is a very important part of uh, transnational literature. And when you're writing, you're doing the same. You're just dodging an obstacle. You make it more simple. You, you just go another way around. And uh, so, uh, uh, Hung Wurst uh, is still living in, in Germany. and the. The first name Hung is uh, Vietnamese, and Gost uh, is a family name of uh, his wife, or I think former wife in the meantime. So this is a book, uh, Kein Messer ohne Rose, 
No Knife Without Roses, that uh, we published in the parallel economy of Buenos Aires uh, with a group of uh, social workers and poets uh, called Eloisa Cartonera, who are, uh, it's a collective that is organizing the publication of books with the hand press and the simple copy, and they are uh, inviting homeless people who are collecting cardboard in the, in the city of Buenos Aires to bring this together, to collect it, and they buy it to a better price than they would find uh, on the normal market. And so they print the books with hand press, they, uh, or they copy them, and these are uh, one pesos book or one dollar books that they sell, I don't know, at, in front of the entrance of theaters and cinemas and, and music halls, and they sell directly, it's a uh, direct distribution. And every cover, front page, is uh, uh, ornamented uh, with stencils, but it's made by hand. So every book is different of all the others. And when the leader of this group, his uh, artist name is Washington Kukurto, was in solitude five years ago, uh, he was mourning every day because he was not with his collective and it was in his so clean castle and it was not uh, the, the, in the streets of, uh, of uh, Buenos Aires. And, uh, but finally, we convinced him that uh, we could be a, use, a useful tool for him and that, for example, the idea he had in mind of uh, finally making the book telling the story of Eloisa Cartonera could be done with our money and that uh, he could work on this. That's how uh, the book appeared. And uh, we sold a lot of that book because this is so exotic and that it's made on the streets and uh, it's... Uh, it's politically correct and it's perfect. So I will speak again about uh, exoticism and my understanding uh, of this. So, uh, and we had uh, the storybook, which is the, the pink one on the second layer, which was the larger book. And in, in addition to this, just for the German market, we made a short story translated into German, published uh, just for the German market, accompanying it. So this is the, the story of Eloisa Cartonera. And they won uh, last year the uh, uh, prize of the European Foundation, the Prince Klaus Prize in, in Amsterdam. And they got the big prize. And now they, they buy their own uh, piece of land and they're building their own house nearby, uh, nearby Buenos Aires. Nearby Buenos Aires means 60 kilometers. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so the pr project is a success. We introduced them in Europe and they were selected by Ivan Vladislavich, who uh, is a second generation South African of Croatian origin. So that's how it worked. Eh? And Bienen sucht nach Samuel Beckett, uh, this is beekeeping after Samuel Beckett, published in 2012 by Martin Page, who is a quite famous uh, French writer who was in solitude. And uh, the book uh, tells a wonderful story of uh, Samuel Beckett, who is with an assistant not only taking care of his uh, hives and, and bees on the roof of his uh, apartment in Paris, uh, but also uh, making fakes in his archive in order to make life difficult to future, uh, to, to future scholars. And uh, the book was published, uh, he gave me the, the French manuscript, uh, we had some of it for uh, organizing the translation. And books like this, they are always reviewed uh, in the uh, major German uh, newspapers. This is the critique we had uh, in Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung uh, last year. But the story is nice because the book was published later in the original version in French. And this is the critique from Le Magazine Littéraire. Uh, and the interesting thing is that uh, when he said that the book was published in French and he is a very active uh, participant in Facebook, some people thought, which I love, that he wrote the book first in German and that it was the French translation that was published afterwards. But no, we published the German translation one year before it was on the market uh, as a French original book. So I know I go through a long story that uh, is typical uh, and somehow a kind of ideal case. Uh, in 2008, the Moldavian uh, writer uh, Nicoleta Yezinenko was in solitude with, uh, with a fellowship and uh, 
she was some a, a kind of a rebel uh, in the house and uh, nothing was uh, like she wanted it to be everything was too clean and too organized and uh, and uh, uh, someday she came to my office and say I wrote a manuscript well, uh, fuck you Europa and I said okay yes yes but uh, I want to publish it uh, okay yes yes and then the, and then she said uh, uh, we have to find a, a german translator for this okay we organized a german translator so what you see is, is the original manuscript of the german translation and uh, written by hand uh, i might recognize my own handwriting uh, nicoletta is in enku and because i think that it's so important that not only Authors are written on the front page, but also translators. I added by hand aus dem Deutschen, aus dem uh, Rumänischen übersetzt von Helga Kopp. And I think that for me it's very important that translators are appearing. So this is the German version. She gave me a French version, we edited it uh, together. And then we were thinking about what I was mentioning at the beginning. How do we make this public? And this is what you see here a few months later. So it's in February 2004. Uh, a collective uh, opening of three different exhibitions and the, the line, the last line uh, at the bottom is Nicoleta Jesinenko, Folk You Europa, Lesung zur Ausstellungseröffnung am uh, 19. Februar. And for this we made a little program which you see here and it's written Lesung auf Deutsch, vorgetragen von Barbara Stoll, which means uh, reading in German, uh, presented by Barbara Stoll, who is a famous uh, German actress. So this is how using the audience that is coming for a larger opening, literature finds its natural place with the famous actress and the person reading the book. But the story continues. Then we made the book with her in the same collection. <coughs> and because this play is not that long, <coughs> we published it in the two languages, in Romanian and in German. And in April, 2005, we had organized with our that time partner in Bucharest, that was uh, Galeria Nua, uh, a special event around uh, solitude and Romanian writers, and uh, so we had an exhibition in the Galeria Nua, but we had also a uh, reading and workshop at uh, Goethe Institute, and this is uh, Nicoletta, that is uh, just a little bit blurry in the background, uh, reading her text in Romanian in, fr in front of the real audience for which it was thought, uh, which was uh, Romanian-speaking persons. And uh, in the audience uh, was uh, a guy uh, who was in charge of uh, presenting uh, the uh, Romanian pavilion at the Biennale, uh, Biennale in Venice, and it was Marius Babias. And uh, <clears throat> he was so impressed by the text that he decided that he would include the text in his reader for the Romanian pavilion. And now I have to uh, explain a little more what is in the text so that you understand. And I write the note that was uh, written, the first note that was written by us, and that was in this grey program. And I uh, want to emphasize that point because in all the cases, in difference to all of you, we are the first to write about an artist, a writer, a new book. So, and as you know, because this is your job, uh, texts like this are copied and pasted, so the first text will be reproduced in several other theatres, publications, presentations, and so on. And it's a special responsibility of writing the first text of comments about an artist or about a writer. So written 2003 at Schloss Solitude, Fuck You Europa can be read as a battle cry of the youth whose, whose hopes were robbed in the countries of the former Eastern Bloc and who feel betrayed by the world of neoliberal profiteering. Fuck You Europa is a text full of disappointment and love, at once both angry and humorous, written by a rebellious author who sees theater as performing a function so redemptive that without it reality would be neither bearable nor comprehensible. From another perspective, that from Moldova, the country that is not a country, Fuck You Europa, 
brings into question the current expansion of Europe and how relevant its value really are. So this is the very first text written on that book. And I quote from this uh, book, which is just uh, the first lines. I just had, I, I had just one friend. He dreamed of robbing a, robbing a bank and I dreamed of the most important thing I have learned from you, Papa, is to never tell anyone my dreams. Independence. No, Papa, not freedom. Independence. Papa, I have to tell you something. So this is how it starts and this is a monologue speaking to uh, the authority of the father, uh, which is somehow representing the nation. So the book, uh, the, the text was part of this large uh, or thick uh, uh, reader that was organized for the uh, Romanian pavilion in 2005 in Venice. And this is in the middle of the book, just this text. And from the presence of this text in the reader developed a huge political scandal not in Moldavia, but in Romania. And it's interesting to follow because you will, at the end, understand the bias and the way how somehow in this assembly, I would say, patriarcha, political patriarcha, is answering to, to such a book. So I quote, the person who was commissioned to carry Romania's flag to the international art show in Venice, Marius Babia's curator, asked the poet Nicoleta Yezunenko to publish her text about Europe and Romania in the show's reader. Her poem is called Fuck You, Europa, and the verses of this confused person from Kisinau are dedicated to Romania and Europe with the financial support of the Ministry of Culture. Her complaint, legitimate in itself, would not bother me if it were not in Romanian's name and at Romanian's expense. So, and it continues, here is this article's rationale. We have paid to be attacked. Everyone is free to express his own ideas with his own money, but not financed by a government in a significant art show supported and funded by the Romanian ministry. And we have to say that 2005 is the year where Romania is entering the European Union. So I do not care. 2007. Ah, so it was just, no, entering, but accept, being accepted, being accepted, sorry. It was just the, the end of the, of the uh, Verhandlungen, sorry. So it continues, I do not care at all about national bigotry, but rather about the waste of honest money. This is about clarifying national interests. The proper way to complain about Europe, the title of the text by Octavian in uh, Journal Null, National Bucharest, 9th of August 2005. And finally, uh, I think the, the prime minister uh, at that time, Kalin Popescu Tariceanu, had uh, to uh, intervene, and he said, uh, none of these contributions represents the official position of the Romanian government, which does not consider judging an art project part of its role. Moreover, the Romanian pavilion in Venice was much appreciated and received a very positive response from visitors. So this is the response of the, uh, of, uh, the uh, Kalin Popescu Tariciano. So the play, has now been translated into Romanian, German, French, English, Hungarian, Russian, Polish, and Japanese. It has been performed in Bucharest, Kisinau, Nancy, Moscow, Tokyo, and New York, and was included in the edition of New Plays in Europe. In June 2006, the piece received the National Prize for the Moldovan Society of Authors as the Theatre Piece of the Year. And by the way, and you look again at the, at the title, most, most readers miss the fact that the word Europa is written in an unusual way. Two full stops separate the syllabes U and Rho, while Pa is capitalized and followed by an exclamation point. EU means I in Romanian, Rho stands for Romania, and Pa is equivalent to by in English. With her provocative title, I buy to Romania, fuck you, Nicoleta Yezinenko firmly rejects those people in Moldova who wish to sever ties with Romania. The title implies that the fate of Moldova is connected to that of Romania, whether one, one wants it or not, which means that it's again a question of transnational literature. It's a question of do, do you want a border? between those countries or not. It's again the same question. 
So now I come to the last part. I'm still in time, or should I? Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, so I come to the last part where probably uh, I will somehow have an, another point of view than some of the lectures I heard. So I, under this title for the last part, I could have presented a book like this by Liliana Korobka, also a Moldovian writer, One Year in Paradise, that is uh, explaining the exploitation of uh, prostitute uh, women coming from Ukraine and Moldavia in uh, Eastern Europe and uh, uh, being in, uh, uh, held in, in slavery. I could have presented this book by uh, Ezi Edugian, the Canadian uh, writer of uh, uh, Ghanaian origin, who was uh, shortlisted, by the way, for the Booker Prize last year with her novel uh, Half Blood Blues, uh, that she wrote uh, in solitude. Uh, and she wrote these books, uh, this book, The Strangers, short stories about uh, first uh, uh, generation immigrants or second generation immigrants uh, from Africa uh, in uh, Canada. But what I will speak about is totally different because uh, in my opinion this notion of transnationality uh, can be like you describe it between uh, uh, persons who are moving and have a nomadic life and are representing uh, the change of identity and crisis of identity. For me the notion of a transnational literature is happening in the relation between the reader and the text. Transnational literature, it's between a book that was written uh, in Canada and me, you, reading it in Germany, in Europe, or in Africa. This is the real heart of the question of transnational literature. It means that we agree to enter into this game and reading books that were not thought for our own book markets, but that we are looking for this difference and we are looking for this transnationality. This is the fact. So I will present you now uh, a story that happened in Nigeria. And I see you smiling. And uh, I, you know Toyin, probably. Toyin Adewale. He was a fellow in 1996. And uh, we published a book with her. Uh, the title is uh, Searching for Aroma. And uh, this is, you, you can read it while I'm, I'm uh, speaking. Uh, this is a very classic poem that is beginning with the subject, uh, the author is a subject saying I, and uh, the gap between the subject and uh, the outworld that is expressed uh, uh, by the they of the readers coming back to I, going to you, your book reads on my table and going uh, further to we and coming back to you. So this is a very classic form of writing a poem in a kind of romantic way. And uh, this poem is dedicated to Ogaga Ifo Vodo. And if, if you look precisely how she's working with alliterations and rhetoric figures, you see, for example, that uh, the negative uh, line, even the trees feel like whips, the W of whips, uh, is appearing at the end again as something uh, which has uh, its autonomy in poetry. These are the two lines. This is why the wind is prowling your words of wasps, of webs and wailing. So, and the question I have uh, regarding this transnational literature in my way of, of understanding it is, how is it possible for me as a reader who is aware of, uh, for example, uh, the shift uh, due to Baudelaire's perception of uh, reality, the shift due to Mallarmé. How is it possible that I can read a poem like this? What, what, is it still possible to have a totally different historical moment in a poetry of today compared to things that said a long time before, no, you, should, you couldn't write like this. So how do you deal with this question? And it's not about postmodernity that everything is possible at the same time in the world, which is a gentle way of describing uh, uh, diversity as we know it. It's something different. And uh, uh, by chance, one year later, Ogaga was a fellow in solitude. And this was an interesting story because uh, he didn't enter the solitude system through the jury, 
but uh, through a little program we have for uh, emergency <coughs> cases. We were informed by Heinrich Böll uh, Stiftung, which is the uh, foundation of the Green Party, that uh, this uh, writer and uh, some of the influent members of the pen club in Nigeria, who had been put uh, in jail, uh, would be free and that uh, it would probably happen again that would find any pretext to put him again in jail so that we should invite him together with the uh, Heinrich Böll Stiftung as soon as possible to Europe and deliver as soon as possible the letter of invitation so that nothing happens with the police. And that's how Ogaga uh, came to solitude. Uh, surprisingly, he was somehow also uh, a kind of... Uh, demanding activist regarding the relation to the academy, but it's okay. And he wrote, uh, we made a book with him, and the last poem of this book is the, dedicated to uh, Chima Ubani, who uh, you will know, but uh, beside you nobody, who was a, a strong leader of the opposition and a fighter for democracy in uh, Nigeria. And this poem is written uh, in a kind of political engagement. This is also something which we considered like, no, it's not possible to write like this. It's a note uh, to Chima Ubani. Finally, they caught up with you, harder to hold than the eel. You wear the riddle of solids into gas vanishing water. So, uh, and the question again, how do we deal with the poetry that uh, is like this? When you have in mind, I don't know, Durs Grünbein or uh, 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 Hungarian poets. And I will explain you why it's possible. Some years later, I found this uh, a little bit by chance. Uh, it was published on a website uh, in 2010. And this is remembering a people's general in the era of empty sloganeering. And Chima Ubani died passed away in 2005 in a car accident that was somehow not totally understandable. And uh, five years later, uh, journalists remembering him. And for me, the poems I had in mind are occupying the spaces between the lines. So suddenly, this is no more something like again, a news about violence or remembering something like a, a justice case, but this is another reality that I perceive in this. And for me, this literature has its necessity because without it, all the news that we receive in radio, in newspapers, in television, from all over the world, that let, let us silent and uh, inactive and passive, and we, are, we just have to take them, and uh, we take this violence of the world, we take this reduction of the world to uh, violence and criminality and civil wars, that poetry, if we know about the country poetry, is exactly transforming this image. It's somehow the flesh around the reduction, the skeleton of the news, and this is also the only way we have to react actively and intellectually and also sensitively to the permanent aggression of news we don't know how to deal with. It makes us to citizens of the world. And it's not about uh, loving uh, exoticism or being interested, but this is uh, our concern, what is happening in the world. As a reader of uh, different newspapers in French and, and German and English, when I see a na the name of a country, I mentioned Guatemala, for example, now you, you read that uh, the president who was, uh, 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 I think, uh, made prisoner and, and sent to America. So if you have in mind the story of the Guatemaltec guy who, who was in solitude, if you... Uh, read about uh, Boko Haram and, and the situation in northern of, of Nigeria now, and you have this poetry in mind, you deal differently in your mind. And this is, for me, a major importance of transnational literature. But this is something that is taking place somewhere else. So now you see, this is uh, my private library at home, and one book that is the smallest is just flashing in your eyes, and it's written Sperik, uh, which means unwieldy. 
And this is this little book we published in uh, 2010 for the 20th anniversary of the Academy. It's the Dictionary of Unwieldy Words. We are inviting uh, all the writers uh, in solitude for this anniversary uh, to deliver little text, essays, poetries about words that are resisting, that are incomprehensible, that are contradictory, that are not translatable. And so I can mention some of them. We had uh, texts about age, artist, age, beige, blue, code, criticality, diatrologia, easy, if teasing, event, grief, lady, and so on and so. And we had 141 authors in 13 languages that were all in the book. And we had in the book always the German translation and the 13 original languages. And I would like to show you a marvelous text that is, again, not about somebody who emigrated and who moved and who is thinking about borders, but this is an uh, Indian writer called Sharmista Mohanty. And uh, uh, my English is so bad and the text is so beautiful, I think it's better you, you read it uh, silent. Uh, 